It is such a lovely Saturday morning and I am excited to be back on your screens with this edition of your most compelling news and current affairs talk show that's tailored to bring China closer to you. We have a packed show today, so brace yourself for the very best of content in the next few minutes. My name is Makiza Latifa. Let's tweak things a bit by starting the show today with the global arena with Jeffrey Sachs, an economics professor and director of the Sustainable Development Center at the Columbia University. The topic for discussion is Israel's occupation of Palestine. And according to him, blocking the two-state solution is actually blocking peace and the real solution to the crisis in Palestine. Let's get rolling. The path to peace in the Middle East is the so-called two-state solution, that there should be a state of Palestine as a member state of the United Nations living alongside the state of Israel with both states having their security. And this two-state solution is the only way to peace because there are two peoples uh, that uh, have been essentially fighting over the same land for many decades. So why doesn't it happen? It doesn't happen mainly because Israel rejects having a state of Palestine next door and the United States has backed Israel in its rejection of a state of Palestine. Now this sounds strange. How could one country object? This should not be the decision of Israel. Uh, this should be the decision of the world community to end this hot war, which is now uh, also killing tens of thousands of innocent people in Israel's assault on Gaza. But under the rules of the international system, the creation of a state of Palestine as a UN member state depends on a vote of the UN Security Council. That vote was first proposed already 13 years ago when the Palestine Authority proposed membership in the UN. When an entity proposes UN membership, it goes to the Secretary General of the UN and then the Secretary General clears it and sends it to the Admissions Committee, which is essentially the UN Security Council itself. This happened back in 2011. And at the time, admissions committee said, well, Palestine meets all the criteria for becoming a UN member state. But Israel didn't want it. Israel wanted to rule over the entire territory. And the United States said to the Palestinians, well, we understand, yes, membership, but why don't you just accept observer status right now? And the Palestinians, who are vulnerable and weak said, okay, if the U.S. says so, because the U.S. promised it will soon be followed by membership. That was yet another lie of many, many lies over many decades. So 12 years later, in the context now of a massive, cruel, war crime ridden destruction of Gaza by Israel, the Palestine Authority said, look, we made this application. We renew the application because it was accepted. It wasn't dismissed. It wasn't rejected. It was put on hold because we listened to the United States unwisely, I would add. So this was taken up again and the UN Security Council voted in April overwhelmingly in favor of Palestine as a UN member state. And then what did the United States do? It vetoed it. So the vote in the UN Security Council was 12 in favor, one veto, the US, and two abstentions, Switzerland and the UK. Now, this is again, one country blocking peace, but the rest of the world is saying, come on, of course we know the answer. So this went from the UN Security Council to the UN General Assembly. And there was a vote in the UN General Assembly, should Palestine be a UN member state. And the vote was 142 in favor and nine against. Who are the nine? The US, Israel, of course, some very small islands, and a couple of a few countries 
uh, that for whatever reasons uh, fell into the US camp on this. But overwhelming world support. And yeah. the UN General Assembly said, well, we need a conference to put this into effect now. The world is united. The UN is the right venue. And the veto of the United States needs to be overcome by making clear that the whole world is on side except for Israel, which opposes absolutely unjustly, and the United States, which has isolated itself diplomatically by this maneuver. In May, the Arab League countries met in Bahrain and had a very good declaration, the Bahrain Declaration, which said, we're ready for peace, we're ready for normalization with Israel, but it must be based on the two-state solution. And this is a peace offering. This is the way to peace. And at the end of that meeting, the King of Bahrain went first to Moscow to discuss this with President Putin. And then he came with the Arab delegation that met with President Xi in Beijing. And the King of Bahrain carrying the Bahrain Declaration said, here is the path. So my recommendation is that China strongly support a UN General Assembly backed global conference so that the world opinion is very clear, so that no country has a veto against world opinion, so that it can become clear to everybody that blocking the two state solution is actually blocking peace. It's not just blocking a state of Palestine, it's blocking the real solution. And in this area, China will, of course, be on the side of the vast, vast proportion of humanity, on the side of the Arab countries, the side of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, the side of the, uh, the non-aligned movement countries, the side of the G77 countries. The U.S. will be diplomatically isolated, but it deserves to be if it's on the wrong side of global opinion. And this is what we need. We need peaceful ways to show that rational, decent thinking leads to a particular solution. We don't need wars for this. We don't need more violence for this. We need to show that the world is united for peace and that that's not even against Israel. That's for Israel's security. But Israel cannot continue to rule over millions of Palestinian people. That's not acceptable. That's not a way to peace. And that's all for the global arena. Next up is my favorite part of the show, which talks about China's relations with Africa and the rest of the world. We'll hear from our global intellectuals who will share their knowledge and expertise with us on various subjects. Don Deba, a journalist and current affairs commentator, is our first guest for this segment of the show. Stay with us. <music> My friend is was uh, Dr. Cynthia McKinney, who is a uh, political science professor at North South University in Dhaka in uh, Bangladesh. Bangladesh is a Muslim country, as most people know, and they, her students, her poli sci students, came to her one day asking about basically U.S. propaganda towards China that focuses on the alleged oppression of Muslims and uh, particularly Uyghurs uh, by the uh, People's Republic. They came to her saying, you know, we go back and forth just normally. This is how our families have done, you know, forever. The borders between here and Western China are pretty open and people flow back and forth and have for a thousand years. We go there to see people and we know exactly what it's like. And this stuff that comes out of your government is obviously a lie. And it's ridiculous to us knowing the facts. Why is it that they do that? And so she said, being a college professor, listen, here we are in a college. First of all, we have to make an inquiry what's really happening. How do you do that? We go there, we prepare a study and we go there and we ask people, what's, what's your life like? And so... That's what they did. They prepared a questionnaire. It was uh, three pages, I think, in uh, English, Chinese, uh, Arabic, and I forget what else. 
and uh, went around. We went to the Muslim uh, quarters in each of the cities. We went to Urumqi, uh, Dunhuang, Xi'an, and Nanjing. And we spent uh, three, four days in each one working, and then a day or two in each one, you know, looking around and having fun. My first impression when I stepped off the, you know, plane out of the airport, looking at Urumqi, was this is a modern city. It's like in the middle of Asia. I think it's the furthest city from any coast uh, in the whole world, I think, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. And so I had this uh, first impression of, wow, they're big, urban modern buildings visible from the door when you walk out and uh everything looked new and bustling and not at all what i would think of as a backwash like you know way in the interior of china away from the you know the coasts and everything so that was my very first impression we stayed the conrad for example was near the, well, pretty very close to the largest mosque in urumqi and um we went to other mosques, and also we made a point of trying to eat and uh, hang out in uh, halal restaurants and other Muslim businesses where people congregated. So everyone that we spoke with that was, first of all, surprised to hear, because we did ask at some point in time, there's this story about this. Do you know anything about any of this? Have you seen you know people being taken away in the middle of the night by guys in trench coats and you know all of that stuff? And you know people would laugh at how how ridiculous it was. Like, how would you describe your life? Would you say your life here? Would you say it's excellent, good, or a very good, good, not so good, whatever? In you know, five or six gradients. And uh, what what are your experiences with the government, both the, you know the local government dealing with the city? Do you have any problems, you know, with your day to day life or business or whatever? The same with the national government. Do you feel that your voice is uh, heard when policy is being made here? Blah blah blah. All these different things that are markers of how do you feel about your environment? Is it healthy and constructive or not? Uh, what kind of a relationship do you feel you have with the state? It's kind of marveling to us, looking at the the way these things have been built. You have the old towns that are in very good repair and reserved and vibrant. And then these rings, where you can see the development as the newer development, these beautiful apartment complexes that here would be characterized luxury apartments and such that ring the cities in, in huge numbers. And the, the new city that's developed around them, it's very impressive. So... But we went to the old towns, and um, what we would stop in, for example, here's a uh, people, businesses there, some of them solicit people to come in, especially they see, you know, foreigners coming through. They made a point, you know, come on in, come on in, have coffee, you know, whatever. We went in, in some places. One, it was a three-story building, and we went in, and uh, the wife, maybe in her 50s, uh, early 60s, and one of her sisters and one of their friends all around the same age are kind of managing the floor, the tables on the, this side of the counter, but waiting tables and greeting people and, and taking orders and such. And then the husband is in the back on the grill, like sweating with a chef's hat on. And one of his friends is sitting over on the side, sipping on a, a beer and this is a coffee shop with a little bakery and, and things in it. So the three of us ordered coffees, and the three women sat down with us and were talking. So Cynthia did a formal interview with her and one of her friends, not the sister, but the friend. That it took like 10 minutes each, and uh, then we all started talking. And the husband came out and sat down and had coffee and, and stuff. So I was curious about this three-story building. I said, why would you live? I mean, it's nice and everything, but why would you live here when that you have all these modern conveniences and the views alone from one of those apartments must be magnificent? She said, we've always been here. This is ours. We live here. This is ours. This place is ours. The look talking about like the whole community too, where she is any. I had no idea that people in China with the socialist and the whole history of it since 1949 had this sense of like proprietorship not formal but essential proprietorship that, that i own the things in my life and that was pretty that impressed me a lot then we went to dunhuang the scale of dunhuang is much more see the word i use here is going to sound 
strange in the context of what I just said. It's much more human scale. You know, it's it, not so many skyscrapers, you know, a lot of two and three story buildings. You have the hotel we stayed in. I don't know if it was a replica of an old, like a little petite village. I don't know, like four blocks of two story buildings with retail on the first floor and various residential on the second. No cars, like walking. And, and it's like almost like a, like a contained strip mall. I don't know if that's an original that's been maintained or if it's a mock-up, uh, whatever. Very comfortable. We stayed in this, in this place. Across the uh, main street that this fronted on was desert and a mountain, sand mountain. So this was the view from our room, our window. There was a camel ride up the sand mountain, like in real sense. It felt more like a city maybe in the 1930s or 40s in terms of scale. Or here... Like in like Greenwich Village in, in New York City, maybe like Greenwich Village was 20 years ago, not quite so much auto traffic. And it was walkable, but busy. We went to the marketplace there also. In fact, I sang karaoke there. Now, again, you have four or five blocks of, uh, you know, the streets are closed, there's tables, the line with restaurants and shops on both sides. Well, we went to a so called uh, seminary or a place where people study to be uh, imams. We went there and interviewed people who were students studying, and they were uh, most definitely from, uh, you know, they were Uyghur. And also, there were a lot of people that were Kazakh that we met, and also in Arumji, that was true. We asked about not just the uh, that these students had with, uh, you know, with the world as Muslims was there a problem and also officially because they have the school and and the mosque there you know how they related to the authorities and, and it's inconceivable to me that people would make up the stories that are made up because they're so easily debunked if you actually go and look but i guess statistically not enough people have whatever have the wherewithal or the interest or whatever to go and look. And so what's on the other side of the world for like 90% of the population or more, uh, your knowledge of it is mediated. The facilities were in incredibly excellent repair. It was um, like polished. And then at the mosque we went to in, in Xi'an also, and that was another large, large congregation, large facility. By their appearance, you can tell that there's not a problem with the authorities. There's no sign, first of all, shutting it down, but also whatever resources you need to maintain gold leafing and, you know, windows and roofs and pavement and such are obviously available. We went to Nanjing. We went to a halal restaurant. We got there about four in the afternoon and they weren't really open yet. And we said that we wanted to talk to some people, maybe some of his customers, maybe some of the staff, whatever, and have this, no problem, no problem, get this in real. So we did that. And when we got to that business, there were, I think, four, either four or five people seated. This was a real conversation and not just the questionnaire. You know, we got to ask some details about, are you enjoying your life here? Do you feel like you can? You have work that's satisfying, that you have the freedom to choose what you want to do, that your needs are taken care of, you're not worried about uh, living outdoors and, you know, all of these basic things? And do you feel oppressed? Do you feel that the government is breathing down your neck, you know, et cetera, et cetera? We got through all of that, and it was a very pleasant conversation. And the answer to all of it was, of course, we're happy here. That's why we're here. I'm having a good, you know, I have a good life. My children have a good life, and, and maybe they'll have a better life than mine. But mine, if they have a life like mine, that'll be fine, too. We get through all of that. This one woman who was not in the family, I think, said, I'd like to know something. I'd like to know why your government insists on lying to the world about us. You see what our life is like. You hear what they say. Why did that? She got really angry, like very emotional. And it was hard for me. You know, it it felt like, a, and, and I know it was, but it almost felt like she was angry with us personally. I think it's because we were there. But she took it very personally. And, and I mean, obviously you would, right? My impression at the end of all of this, I was more convinced. I had surmised, having studied and participated in U.S. Uh, history and, uh, and engagement in the world, you know, I'm 70 years old now. So, and I've been interested in this stuff since I was in school, five, six years old. So 60 years anyway, of having some understanding what's going on, assumed 
particularly given the almost cartoon-like presentation they make, that what was being said about China's treatment of Uyghurs and Muslims was not true. I assumed it also, knowing the history of, of China and knowing world history and human behavior, there would be absolutely no purpose whatsoever for China to do these things to people in China, because it's never in anyone's interest to do that. China is obviously doing something right. They're very successfully going from uh, where they were about 50 years ago to basically being like the design of the future for our species, perhaps. I was doing this calculus in my head, walking into breakfast one morning in Xi'an, that uh, right now there's a billion and a half people eating breakfast, and they're going to have lunch and dinner, too. That's four and a half billion meals that have to be prepared every day. And I know everyone here eats. So <laughs> that alone gave me like a, a respect for the scale of the operation of the uh, economy in China. So I was suspicious anyway, because I just I don't buy cartoons very easily. But when I got there and saw the life there would be the envy of most people in the United States if they were looking at it with their eyes opened. You know, that without the haze of propaganda that would, looking at this, looking at a city full of people, what people are up to today, how it works, who gets what at the end of the day, most people in this country would be very envious of people in China in the cities that I visited. That, I think that's a, the most concise summary of what I saw that I can come up with. I know I'm one of them. <laughs> Let's now move on to the next part of the Thinkers Forum, where the director of the Geopolitical Economy Research Group at the University of Manitoba, Professor Radhika Desai, speaks on how Prime Minister Narendra Modi's re-election will affect the relations between China and India, and also whether or not India will intervene in China's Taiwan issue, following in the footsteps of the U.S. <music> I mean, so I, I guess I'd like to give my answer in three parts. So the first is that uh, basically what we have now is a shift back to coalition politics. That is to say Modi is, relies particularly on two big allies to take him over the 272 mark, which will allow him to have um, majority government. So this means that uh, he has to soften his Hindutva politics. He has to accept a lot of it. But I think so. So there is reason to imagine that he will not be able to be as hard line as he has been. However, whether this will translate into foreign policy is a separate question for a number of reasons. So let me say, first of all, that you have to understand that Modi's party, which is the BJP, which has been in power before, it was in power in coalition between 1998 and 2004, because you see, even after all the mobilization based on Hindu identity and anti-Muslim politics, which they engaged in very strongly in the 1990s, they were not able to pass the roughly 25 percent of the vote mark. They had to enter into coalition. And so this party has always been in favor of two things which do not augur very well for Indochina relations. The first is that they have, from a very early point in their history, seen China as the main enemy of India. They have always targeted China, going back to the 62 war. In fact, yes, you know, the 62 war, uh, if you think about it, was a problem, you know, was a mis it, it was based on many mistakes made by India. But because they have consistently kept up this, you know, opposition to Nehru's earlier policy of friendship with China, you know, Hindi, Hindi, Chini, Bai, Bai, you know, that Indians and Chinese were brothers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, this policy, the BJP, the Hindu nationalist right, has essentially milked the failures of 1962 for everything they can in order to accuse any policy of friendship with China as being misguided, deluded, etc. And by keeping up a very high decibel rhetoric of this sort, 
they have essentially prevented uh, a process that India needs to to go through uh, in order to have good relations with China, in order to benefit from a uh, good relation with China, both in terms of security and in terms of economy. I think India Indo-Chinese cooperation could go a very long way. But this whole process is being stopped. And what is that process? The Indian position on the border disputes, which is the main uh, issue that that India keeps uh, raking up, the Indian position has been based, as many scholars in India today recognize, on a colonial position, the co colonial drawings, uh, lines drawn on a map. There are many reasons to believe that the position that India is taking is not a valid one and that the position China is taking, which is that let's sit down, negotiate, look into the interests, what works, etc. And also while doing so on the border dispute, let's advance our interests. Let's advance our cooperation on other matters. So China has always been very, shall we say, uh, giving in terms of its relationship with, with India. But without going through this process of real Realizing that India's territorial claims are not valid, that they are more open to question, Indians will not come up with any position. Now, uh, come up to a cooperative attitude to China, no matter who is in power. Now, having said that, given the reality that India's position was not viable, history itself, I mean, reality itself exerted a certain type of gravity on uh, Indian government. So that in the period since the 1980s, basically, India and China have engaged in a lot of intensive diplomacy, which continued even under the Vajpayee government. And then also under the UPA government of Mr. Manmohan Singh from 2004 to 2014. And this led to considerable improvements in relations between India and, and China. And a creeping recognition that, yes, there should be negotiations on the border dispute. And while those negotiations take place, let's also deepen our economic relationship. So all of that was proceeding generally well until it was cut short by Modi. Now, and I want to talk about Modi in a minute, but let me also say one final thing before going on to Modi and the other things he's done. The key to understanding, I mean, or let me rephrase that. The UPA government in particular made big advances in good relations with China. But what you had, essentially, they achieved progress in Indo-Chinese relations, but they did not at the same time transform the discourse within India. They did not say, look, folks, it's time for us to change our attitude towards the border dispute. We need to go through a process of learning. We need to acknowledge that our position is not 100% correct. So they did not put this out in the public discourse. And that means that the Hindu right has continued to exploit anti-China sentiments in India. They have been allowed to remain. And this is a fault of the UPA government. And I think any secure progress in India can, that cannot be easily reversed relies on having this process, this ideological process in India. So so that's about uh, China and the progress. And, and, and under Mr. Modi, essentially, Mr. Modi, I think Mr. Modi is quite well aware that India cannot win any kind of military confrontation with China. But nevertheless, little skirmishes have been exploited to the fullest in an anti-China rhetoric, which then uh, uh, consolidates the Hindu and Indian nation behind Mr. Modi, etc. So he has been totally uh, free and he has also not been particularly good at pursuing, you know, the economic relationship and so on. So, I mean, quite frankly, I personally think that Modi's foreign policy generally consists of a whole bunch of photo opportunities for himself and other world leaders. You know, in fact, when Modi dresses, you know, as you may know, he has this obsession with dressing in certain ways and, you know, very expensively and so on. So that's all he seems to care about. And the only other thing he cares about is giving his corporate cronies contracts abroad, particularly, as you may know, for example, Mr. Adani accompanied Mr. Modi on a state trip to Australia and came back with a, a bunch of, you know, mining contracts and, and what have you. So these are the sorts of things. Otherwise, he really has not much of any foreign policy. So this lack of a defined foreign policy, plus a desire to exploit anti-China and, of course, anti-Pakistan sentiments in India means that Mr. Modi is not being very conducive to good relations with China. And finally, the third part, which is that 
Mr. Modi, like the previous BJP government, is also ideologically much more in favor of good relations and ever closer relations with the United States. The best example of this would be that, you know, when um, Mr. Vajpayee, the previous uh, BJP prime minister who was in office between 1998 to 2004, Mr. Vajpayee, within days of coming to power, conducted a second nuclear test. If you remember, well, you may not remember, but you may know that he consult, conducted a second nuclear test. And he immediately following on uh, the nuclear test, he wrote a letter to President Clinton in which he made it very clear that the reason for the nuclear test is a short letter and you can find it on the web. The purpose of the Indian tests was to essentially strengthen India's defenses against China. China was regarded as the main problem. And essentially, this was, of course, uh, under Clinton, still in uh, China, US-China relations were better than what they are now. But nevertheless, Essentially, Mr. Vajpayee was saying to Mr. Clinton that India and uh, the U.S. should make common cause against China. And this tendency has continued. It has also involved India becoming ever closer to Israel as part of a larger regional strategy. And, and of course, what also unites Israel and India under Modi, Israel under Netanyahu and uh, India under Modi, and generally Zionism and Hindutva, is their common opposition to Islam and so on. So this is a part of the strategy. So Mr. Modi would dearly love to go ever closer to the United States. However, he faces two problems, as we have discussed on this, you know, many times before, with, I have discussed with you many times before, and I have said many other places, the Western economies and the US economy in particular are not in a very strong position right now to offer anything economically attractive to most of their partners. They are not capable of uh, creating, cementing sustainable relationships where they provide some benefit as the bigger partner, as the richer partner to their partners. So, and on the other hand, the US and the West are not so attractive. Then what has happened, of course, is that the Ukraine war has created a situation in which Modi is forced to lean closer to Russia than it would like to, because the other part of leaning closer to the US is also, of course, to ab abandon India's historically strong relations with Russia and which uh, have been dependent on two things in particular. One is, of course, great defense cooperation. And the other is a certain economic relationship. Now, defense cooperation uh, has been certainly diluted on the part of the Indians who are seeking weapons more and more from Western countries rather than from Russia. But at the same time, with the Ukraine uh, conflict, the rise in the price of oil has put India in a bind and also has given both carrot and stick to maintain at least some kind of decent relation with Russia. The carrot, of course, is that India is able to import oil cheaply because without this cheap oil, the rate of inflation in India would go up massively because India is very heavily reliant on imported oil. So there is that. And the uh, the stick, of course, is that uh, sorry. That's the stick that in India can uh, India needs to import that. And the carrot is that, of course, many of Modi's corporate cronies are making a lot of money importing cheap Russian oil and then selling it on to European customers as Indian exports, etc. So that they, there is this kind of circular trade going on. Russia also benefits, etc. So. Under the, a new arrangement of rupee-ruble trade that Russia and India have, India has been buying a lot of Russian oil. But on the other side, by the way, the Russians are not particularly happy with the outcome of these arrangements. They had entered it very happily, hoping that everything would be fine. But what they are finding is that while India is buying a lot from Russia in the form of oil, etc., there is not much that Russia needs wants to buy from India. So Russia is ending up with a pile of rupees it doesn't know what to do with. So that's another element. So that in this ever closer relations with the West, as India has had to, would like to distance itself both from Russia and China, but it is finding it hard to do so in the case of Russia. In the case of China as well, I would say that, you know, India, uh, India's markets are today like ordinary 
neighborhood markets in India are more and more reliant on importing goods from China, which being very efficiently produced, inexpensive, keep down the rate of inflation, which would otherwise go even higher than it has already gone. So India is reliant on that. Many Indian businessmen would like to keep good relations with India. But nevertheless, India continues to uh, provoke China by joining military exercises in the South China Sea with the so-called freedom of navigation exercises, joining the Quad, ever getting ever closer with Japan, being part, happily engaging in the U.S. attempt to transform the Asia-Pacific into the Indo-Pacific and so on with India as a major tool. So it's a complex situation. Modi would dearly love to be even closer to the U.S., but circumstances are not permitting that. So, but nevertheless, Modi is not eager to, to give in to China. And one final point, many uh, of Modi's acolytes uh, in the media, in scholarship, in the scholarly world, one of the things they point to is that India is losing, that the strategy of moving closer to China initiated under the UPA, Congress-led UPA government of 2004 to 14, has been very bad for India because India now has a very big trade deficit and India is not, you know, is sliding in its uh, ra world rankings and, and so on. But the fact is that if you want to do something about India's trade deficit, China is not stopping you. China is not China is offering to sell its products, but China is not stopping India from becoming a manufacturing hub. What becoming a manufacturing hub, uh, an economic power requires, however, is a muscular industrial policy, a clear development strategy which expands the Indian market. India cannot be a export platform for the rest of the world. And in any case, India first needs to fulfill the needs of its extremely deprived citizens. It needs to increase their incomes. It needs to increase their consumption. It needs to increase. And, and so creating a larger Indian market with a well-employed, with high employment, good wages, will create a vast stimulus for India's growth, which can be fulfilled by any you know, by a decent economic and industrial policy. But India is not following this route. India has, on the whole, uh, under Modi, impoverished its people, created ever more inequality, shrunk the Indian market rather than expanded it. And all of this is the real reason why India is falling behind, not because of the existence of China or even India's trade with China. I would say that today uh, a lot of educated Indians are all too happy to raise questions about the one China policy, like the US is trying to do. It's trying to make it ambiguous, right? And it has always been ambiguous. As you know, the moment that the US recognized uh, China in the 1970s, it also passed the Taiwan Relations Act so that it would send arms to China. So that on the one hand, it was saying, you know, one China principle on one China policy. And on the other hand, it was already diluting it. So India is, uh, can, Indian opinion can go in that direction. Unfortunately, like I said, many people in India recognize that the whole narrative of Indochina relations has been very problematic in India. But these people still remain a minority. They are, to my, in my view, they are right. But they are confined to certain niches in the public discourse. The mainline public discourse is always that you know, whatever China does should be regarded as, you know, authoritarian, hegemonic, you know, trying to be hegemonic in, in Asia and elsewhere and uh, pursuing its own economic interests and, and, and so on and so forth. And I mean, not saying that China should not pursue its own economic interests, but I think China's genius has lain in trying to find mutual benefits with its partners that, you know, we benefit, but you also benefit. And this is the way in which China has built its relations with its many, many partners in the region and in the world. That is a very important question, and I would say that we do not fully know the answer. Uh, on the one hand, one would hope that the existence of the coalition government would pull some sort of restraint on India vis-a-vis -vis China, that even when the Congress-led government was improving relations with China, it did not do enough to dislodge the false narrative about India about the India-China border dispute in India. And without with that not having been done, it's quite possible that Modi will be able to make Indian opinion lean in an anti-China direction in those circumstances. 
However, so, so that's another element in the situation. And a third element in the situation is how responsible or irresponsible is India's defense leadership? It, will the heads of the various armed services be able to say to the uh, prime minister, look, prime minister, this is a very dangerous position to take. We cannot stand up to any military challenge, uh, any military conflict with China. So please be careful, etc. We don't know whether this is the case. And indeed, from my reading, it's clear that over the last decade, the Modi government has been introducing changes in the army, which are likely to put yes people in top positions. So that, you know, this is, and I also feel that uh, both vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan and vis-a-vis -vis China, the possibility that the Modi government will act in a completely delusional manner, you know, not based on any realistic assessment of India's strengths or for that matter, India's interests, but in a completely delusional manner in its effort to be pro-US and unmindful of in the limitations of India's military or economic preparedness they may very well take a problematic, a deeply problematic position. They may involve India in wars. I don't put it past them. Given the way in which Modi has taken terribly consequential decisions like demonetization, like the COVID lockdowns, without a care for what happens to ordinary Indians, I think that this kind of decision is not beyond him. I would say that uh, among the educated elite, which unfortunately for us, for the Indochina relations, is among the most pro-US in the world. The middle class in India is among the most pro-US in the world. Therefore, their tendency is to accept what the US says as the correct position, rather than, you know, India has had a good anti-imperialist past. And in the first uh, many decades of independence, much of India's foreign policy discourse did follow an attempt to understand imperialism, its history, the need to resist it, and so on. And it's a wrap on today's edition of China Now. I hope you enjoyed the show as always, and you have been adequately informed and educated on happenings in China and elsewhere in the world. Please share with me any comments or suggestions you may have for the coming episodes of the show through the email provided below. My name is Marquisa Latifa, and I will see you same time next week. Enjoy the rest of our programs.